what do cows, sheep, cannibalism and somehow zombies all have in common? The answer is prions and that's what we're going to be talking about today. In the early 18th century, specifically the year 1720, Spanish shepherds started noticing some strange behavior from their sheep, mostly related to chewing, so they chew a bit differently. Later on this progressed to some strange movement disorders, where the sheep wouldn't be able to keep up with the flock, and slowly became more and more isolated. However, this progressed and became even more strange behaviors, where the sheep would start scraping themselves against the fences. This would lead to skin lesions, losing their fur, and overall the she sheep would become harmed. Over time, all of these sheep died, and nobody really knew why. At the time, these weird behaviors were called scrapey, because of how the sheep would scrape themselves against the fences. Later on, they didn't really realize, but they discovered the first disease in a class of disorders called transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Later on, many of these diseases started being pinned down in other species, such as the mink transmissible encephalopathy, chronic wasting syndrome in elks, and even in cows, mad cow disease, which we're going to talk about later on in this video. When it comes to infectious diseases, there are a few agents that can cause it. These include viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, different helminths, even animals. However, when it comes to scrapie, none of these really fit the mold. Because even after using high pressures, UV radiation, ionizing radiation, extremely high pressures, the scrapie agent was still remaining intact. And after establishing a familial link, it was discovered that it's not really a virus, as previously theorized, instead, it's a prion. So, when it comes to all of these previously mentioned ag agents, all of them are considered alive, with some debates over viruses and whether viruses are alive or not. However, when it comes to prions, there's not really a debate whether it's alive or not, because it's not even like an organism. It's actually just a protein, a misfolded protein that gets into your body and causes your normal proteins to misfold. If we stop for a second to consider transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Transmissible means contagious, or it can spread from person to person. Spongiform means that it was going to make the tissues of your brain look like a sponge. And encephalopathy basically means a disease of the brain. So in other words, this disease is going to cause some small vacuoles to appear in your brain, giving it almost a sponge-like appearance once looked down in the microscope. So this, this disease happens because these misfolded proteins, the prions, they're called PRPSC proteins. And they're misfolded because they have more beta helixes than the normal proteins we have, which is the PRPC, which has more alpha helixes on them. So once we somehow get in contact with the disease protein, it will migrate first to our lymphoid tissues. From there, it's gonna migrate to our brains, our central nervous system. Inside our brains, the PRPSC, or the diseased protein, will interact with our normal proteins, the PRPC, and it's going to cause them to misfold. So it's almost like a self-propagating kind of mechanism, where a diseased protein gets in contact with a normal protein and makes them alter themselves. The normal PRPC proteins, they're coded by the PRPN gene, and they're normally in our neurons. However, once enough disease proteins accumulate inside our neurons, it's going to lead to apoptosis of the neuron through the 1433 protein pathway, which is going to cause our neurons to die, and this is what will lead to the vacuolation they're going to see in histological tissue. So, because this is in theory a normal protein from our bodies, our immune system doesn't really detect it as being foreign. In other words, we're completely vulnerable to it. We don't have a defense mechanism against this disease mechanism, which is one of the reasons why prions are so scary. On top of that, if you ever see a patient you're suspecting of having prion disease, there's some tests you can run in order to see if they might have this disease. One of them is some sharp spikes on EEG, but also an increase of the 1433 protein in their cerebrospinal fluid. However, none of these are definitive, and the only way that you can actually diagnose this disease is through a brain biopsy post-mortem, once the patient has passed away. Generally speaking, prions are insidious, and they are uniformly fatal. That means that they 
come out of nowhere and they kill all of their victims. You're probably not really scared now because you're thinking, well, as far as I'm aware, I'm not a sheep or a cow or an elk or a mink. So this shouldn't really affect me. However, unfortunately, there are some prion diseases that can affect humans. And now we're going to talk about Kuru, which is one of them. In 1954, in the island of Papua New Guinea, cases of prion diseases, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, started to happen in humans. This was odd and it was termed the laughing death because some reports say the people affected would laugh until they died. This is not entirely true. The disease did become endemic in that region. And that's because of a tradition in a small tribe to eat the brains of the family members that were deceased as a sign of respect. In this way, if someone was infected and died, and then another healthy person ate their brains, the protein would be transmitted to them, and they would start having the disease. And when they passed away, this would perpetuate because someone else would eat their brain and get the disease as well. In this way, through cannibalism, the disease would spread itself to different members of the community. And you're probably thinking, well, this is kind of scary, but I'll never perform cannibalism, so I'm safe. To which I tell you, think again, because right now we're going to talk about mad cow disease. So bovine spongiform encephalopathy, also known as mad cow disease, was first discovered in the 1980s. That's because there was a change in how UK cattle was maintained and fed. So essentially farmers in the UK wanted to give their cattle more protein so they'd grow quickly. In order to do that, they fed cow meat and sheep meat to cow. So in other words, there was a form of cannibalism being done to the cattle in the UK, where cows would eat cow meat and sheep meat. And this created the perfect environment for prion diseases to spread, because if one contaminated piece of meat was given to cows, they would then become contaminated. And this cycle would kind of perpetuate itself. And eventually, this cattle would be fed to humans. Unfortunately, more than a decade later, these humans that consumed infected meat developed a new form of prion disease, called the variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob or VCJD disease. What is so scary about variant CJD and transmissible spongiform encephalopathy in general is that it takes years for the disease to actually show up, for the disease process to actually start. But once it does, the person dies within a year, usually within a year. And there's no known treatment to it. So once you have it, it's pretty much a death sentence. Generally, symptoms in humans are a bit different, and they generally include ataxia, myoclonus, behavioral changes such as just staring to empty space, myoclonus, dementia, and unfortunately, eventually death. Now you're probably thinking, well, I'm just vegetarian, so this disease can't impact me. I'm not gonna eat meat, I'm not gonna be exposed to infected meat, and I'll be fine. Unfortunately for you, there are other ways of getting prion diseases, and some of them are inevitable. CJD can be sporadic. First described in the 1920s, sporadic basically means it can happen to anyone at any time. It can also be familial. Familial is because it spreads between family members, and it's usually caused by a mutation on the PRPN gene. I think it's a cold in 200. Also, it can be iatrogenic, or caused by medical procedures. In which case, an infected donor may be the equipment's not cleaned properly and it spreads to another person. It's also been documented in corneal replacements, so if you get a cornea from someone else, you can get the disease as well. Just as tragic as CJD is another prion disease called fatal familial insomnia. In this disease, there's a mutation to the PRPN gene, however, now it's a colon 178. This is gonna cause the abnormal prion proteins to build up in the thalamus and it will disrupt the person's sleep cycle. Initially, the person will have some, some level of insomnia. This will later on progress to a complete inability to sleep, inevitably leading to hallucinations and at last, unfortunately, death. Other forms of Bryan diseases exist as well, such as gerstmann strassler syndrome, which is another form of brain degenerative disorder, which is usually genetic as well. So I've probably scared you enough, but I want to finish on a positive note, and that's, that is that prions are actually really rare. The incidence is about 1 per 1 million cases per year for the most common prior diseases, which is really small, and the mean age is 62 years old. 
So I'd say you're relatively safe, unless you're a cannibal. So, <laughs> thank you. I guess Friars makes us reflect on the importance of epidemiology in rigorous studying and analyzing of our environment. Without, without these, we would have never known how transmissible prions are and how deadly they are. Thank you so much for watching, leave a comment down below, subscribe, and I'll see you later.